Okay, we're now recording and, and we're live. And I, I'm going to give it at least to Molly gets uh, in as a participant. Uh, welcome to those who are active in the room. Uh, we're going to start in about one minute. Uh, so if you would kindly be patient, uh, we appreciate that. And uh, looking forward to uh, our discussion today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending upon where in the world you are. Uh, I think that covers uh, the, the, the panel. Um, <clears throat> my name is Robert Kahn. I'm Managing Director uh, at Automated Financial Systems. We're a leading provider of lending platforms to major financial institutions uh, in the U.S. and globally. Uh, so we're a 50-year-old fintech company. Um, I'm joined today by uh, some very... Um, you know, knowledgeable experts in the field, and I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves, starting with you, Suzanne. Thank you, Robert. Uh, I'm Susanna Hamesta. I'm the CEO of uh, Fintech Mundi. We are uh, helping fintechs uh, to scale uh, throughout uh, the world. Um, I'm 10 years from uh, Nordea, uh, the Nordic uh, bank in, in the Nordics, uh, and then I am uh, participating in, in quite a few boards, uh, either financial services or uh, fintech uh, for them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Siddharth. Hi. Thanks, Robert. Um, I'm Siddharth. I'm the founder of Stonebench, based in Singapore. Stonebench is a research-based writing and editorial services company. I'm a former financial journalist, and in my current role, I've worked with uh, several fintechs, fintech firms based in, based in Singapore and in the region, and spoken with several practitioners working at the intersection of banking and technology. Great. Thank you. And uh, Federico. Hi, everyone. Um, good good morning, good afternoon, and uh, uh, to everyone also more east and, uh, and west. Uh, my name is Federico Travella. I'm the founder and the chief executive of Novica. Um, I'm a Belgian-Italian technology entrepreneur for a decade now. Before starting Novicap, I was a managing director at Rocket Internet, where I helped scale e-commerce ventures in Asia Pacific and um, in Africa. Um, thanks for inviting me today. Happy to, to chip in on everything fintech and, and banking. Great. And we had initially two other panelists, uh, Jean Lehman uh, from uh, Cyber Capital, and he's not going to be able to join us, and Molly Shea from uh, Western Union, who will be joining us uh, shortly once uh, the technical issues she's having gets resolved. Well, <clears throat> the topic today is banking in the era of fintech. And when I participated in some of the other sessions earlier in the um, day, uh, things like uh, climate change and global warming and COVID uh, and uh, <coughs> gender equality and diversity, um, you know, some might think that fintech isn't quite as, as relevant, but, um, when you think about it, everything that we do needs to be supported by by finance. And the banking and the fintech uh, sectors are our best hope 
for finance getting to the right place at the right time in the most efficient way. Um, and I remember when I was a very young man leaving grad school, moving from Washington, D.C. to uh, Philadelphia to become a banker. Uh, and I went to say goodbye to my, uh, my priest. Uh, and he said, well, what are you going to do? And I told him I was joining a bank. And he said, well, bankers do God's work, too. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I think it, what we are talking about today is, is very relevant and fits nicely with the whole uh, Horasis uh, ethos. Um, banks have struggled in optimizing relationships uh, with fintech firms. And, and they've really deployed uh, one of three approaches, ignore, uh, compete, or collaborate. So the first approach no, is no longer viable. So Suzanne, uh, if you could kick us off, how has the COVID experience clarified the balance uh, between competition and collaboration uh, with banks and fintechs? The banks and the fintechs, uh, they have been uh, on their backs uh, for quite some time. Uh, and of course, uh, banks uh, have uh, the trust, the money, the customers and the costly legacy system. They are, uh, of course, uh, investing in, in uh, fintech, uh, partnering with fintech and, and competing with uh, fintech. Uh, but what they need is uh, to digitalize and uh, be more user friendly with uh, uh, user, yeah, UX uh, design and, and so forth uh, to that. And uh, the COVID uh, has speeded up uh, the pace uh, with the digitalization and everything that comes with it. And then on the si other side, the fintechs, they do have agility, low cost, state of the art uh, technology, uh, which they can provide uh, to the bank uh, in a collaboration as a customer uh, customer uh, and, and uh, buyer uh, or in the collaborations uh, because they're offering something out to the market. The fintechs, they, their challenge is uh, scaling, uh, funding and building a sustainable uh, business uh, and uh, get to the bottom line, not only uh, top line or uh, getting the investors. But what we see, though, that in uh, banks, they are investing in, uh, in fintechs, either to have a uh, look in and learn uh, to get a return on investment uh, or to gradually uh, take over, acquire uh, the fintechs. So there are many variations uh, in it. But what, uh, what we see or what I see is that uh, collaboration is here to stay between the fintechs and, and the banks. And I say collaboration is the new uh, innovation. So that's a short intro to, to that uh, topic. Well, that, that, that's great. I, I think there's a lot to what you just shared. Uh, but uh, let me turn to Siddharth. And do you want to respond uh, to Molly, uh, to uh, Suzanne's comments. Mm. Suzanne, thanks, thanks so much for that. Um, I, I tend to agree. I tend to agree to a great degree with what Suzanne said, and you know, speaking a little bit about you know, from an Asian perspective, you know, while while arguably Asia has been slower to move towards digitalization of finance and banks, you know, in the recent past, rapid strides have been made, and we all know the reasons for it. You know, deepening smartphone, mobile internet penetration. Um, in many ways, East Southeast Asia, you know, pretty much taking the lead in this respect. Uh, while I'm not not entirely sure, I mean, the question is very relevant. I'm not sure if COVID has sh uh, clarified the balance any further. And I think that is because, like Suzanne was saying, I think it's we are seeing a lot of collaboration, and I think that is going to continue. There is... Uh, why do I say that? Because there's growing acknowledgement among banks that they have to adapt to meet changing customer tastes, behaviors, and fintechs require that scale. And you know, increasingly, there's an appreciation that in many respects, they're better off collaborating with banks. Uh, that said, you know, we also see a lot of banks still trying to do a lot of it in-house so that, you know, in that sense, one could look at as as the two types of institutions competing how successful those endeavors will be, you know, that remains to be seen. But, but I think one key point, uh, if we look at, if we look at the larger, in the larger scheme of things, I think till such time that banks, uh, that sorry, that fintechs are, are not taking in customer deposits, I think it is hard for them to really be able to, to compete with the banks in a traditional sort of a sense, which also, uh, has various implications, I would think. Um, and my last point, I think, is that you know, while we while we will likely see greater collaboration, but um, there's 
uh, sorry, while we might see competition ahead, I think I think we're likely to continue seeing more collaboration because of the thrust towards digitalization. And I think both both sides bring something to the table, which they can capitalize on. I'm, I'm actually quite curious why you think Siddharth um, deposit banking is, is, is so key for, for fintechs. Uh, in, in certain respects, for certain kinds of fintechs, I'm, I think it's, it's, a, it's a recent bias. You know, when I think of, for example, the digital banks and the licenses that are being given out in Singapore, uh, if you look at it purely from, the, uh, from in terms of the cost of funds, I think deposits are key. And um, while that is not to suggest that there's there's a whole host of other things that fintechs can do, but I was speaking more from the perspective of the cost of funds that would enable fintechs to, to really take on banks from a competition standpoint, you know, in terms of what, what the banks are all about. So more, I was coming more from that perspective. You're talking about lending products, no, or credit products then? Yes. Okay. Because right now, I mean, and, and I guess this is a more European perspective, but, but generally speaking, what I'm seeing with most fintechs and, and neo banks, um, they look at their, their cash deposits as a liability, right? Especially um, considering negative interest rates and, and uh, the, just uh, the risk weighted assets and, and, um, and regulatory capital they have to, uh, to, to have to, to be able to accept those deposits. You see actually a lot of those late stage growth equity rounds are because the FinTech isn't able to absorb the deposits. Now, once you have the deposits, they also start to realize if you want to build credit products or investment products on top of that, it's really expensive, right? Because the capital you have to, to, to keep um, for, for developing such a product is, is going up quite dramatically. So as such, in my view, um, the deposit banking option, uh, building a balance sheet is, is generally um, unattractive. Another thing also what, what I've seen um, is that with the whole move of central banks, and I think this is a very exciting point, um, the move of central banks towards digital currencies, where eventually you have a disintermediation and the typical uh, financial intermediaries, financial institutions, banks, payment providers, are being disintermediated and you can pretty much build um, payment services uh, directly on top of, of the, the central bank via the digital currencies. Mm. Um, the need for a banking license becomes a lot uh, a lot less. So in fact, I think in, in the future, um, taking out the, the credit aspect for a second, there's going to be less less need to obtain a credit or a, sorry, a banking license better. And that's, I think, also something which, which I'm starting to see that the attractiveness of being a bank, um, besides the multiples you trade at, uh, becomes a lot less, uh, less, lot less exciting in our view. Well, it doesn't also depend on stage and scope. Um, you know, it, it, at this stage in the economic cycle with negative interest rates, deposits aren't that interesting. At, at 5%, uh, you know, uh, or, or more, uh, they become very interesting. And then what's the scope of the organization? What are they trying to do? Obviously, for fintechs, uh, you know, they don't have to be a, a challenger bank or a neobank to, to provide certain types of services that are profitable. But what's the, um, what's the long-range plan? What are the, the financial services businesses that uh, players want to participate <laughs> in? And, and how, what is needed to support that from both, you know, traditional sources like uh, assets and liabilities and, and, and technology. Um, and I'll I'm, throw that open to anyone. Just so uh, I think one other question, just one other point is that uh, it also, I would think depends on uh, depend. It also depends a lot on the stage at which the banks are in terms of their adoption of technology. Um, and while I understand it's a slightly smaller perspective, but you know, when we look at the Singapore market, right, one of the questions that, we always ask, in this case, the digital banks or you know, even some fintechs that want to offer a wider range of services, that a lot of the banks are already doing so much of it and are doing it rather well. So in that context, you know, where does that leave, in this case, the digital banks you know, to start afresh? Yes, they don't have assets and legacy assets that 
that is an advantage in this time but so it's a little bit from that perspective as well in terms of um what their competition looks like well you know with with that in mind um and i'll get back on track in a, in a minute i'm sorry uh, but <laughs> y- y- you look at bbva and and simple and how th- that um fintech was so far ahead of everyone and had a incredibly loyal customer base for their innovative products and, and with the acquisition by bbva bbva couldn't do the trick it couldn't keep that innovation within the culture of of the longer larger bank um and and other um other competitors passed them because they were more innovative more available or able to give clients what they want and i i realize this is mainly on the retail side uh, but you know i i throw that out for you to comment on the the, the role of innovation and, and the cultural challenges between um traditional banks and uh and fintech companies Yeah and, and that's uh, the balance uh, in what you started uh, with uh, having the agile uh, fintechs uh, versus the uh, old uh, cultural uh, silos uh, type of uh, financial services and of course the banks are are getting closer to a fintech uh, type of culture but still they have a cultural legacy they have a system legacy uh, and and of course uh, how they appear in in, in the market so i think uh, over time uh, you you will see they coming closer and closer uh, in the way of uh, the cultural thing because of the digitalization uh, to it but that's a, that's a tricky question or it's not a question but the tricky situation for the financial service uh, to be in how are they evolving uh, into a much more uh, user friendly uh, bank uh, whether it's on the consumer side or or the business side and for the business side i think it's a lot to take out uh, there uh, in the digitalization and that's usually the place where the banks are uh, earning the most uh, money uh, because uh, they have uh, the whole package uh, helping uh, the, cost, uh, the 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 companies uh, to to scale to uh, export to uh, merge also all those uh, uh, support they need because it's such so much uh, bigger compared to the individual uh, consumer and the media has uh, covered uh, the retail side uh, which uh, the bbva have uh, seen or other uh, banks that are are heavy on the, on the consumer side and then uh, you don't hear too much about uh, Uh, the corporate side or the SME side. The SME is uh, under uh, supported from the banks, hence uh, so many uh, digital banks that is uh, coming up in this area, and that's not sold uh, yet. Uh, I, I'm going to try to get us back on track with our, our questioning, but this is this is wonderful. So 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 take us off track. I I, I think it's very important to look at uh, what's top of mind uh, for C-suite executives of the bank. And what I continue to tell my colleagues: don't look at the feature functionality of our um, of our product. Yet we might be have the best bread box in the world, uh, but if that's not if they're not eating bread, it really doesn't matter. Um, what are the solutions uh, that are needed by those C suite? What how do, what's relevant for the problems they're trying to solve, and, and how do we align with that? So top of mind. Issues for C-suite executives are a are, are point of focus, um, and you know, I, I think one of the one of the areas that just keeps coming up to me is is data. Uh, you know, data management, data accessibility. Uh, there's so much out there. It, it's the competitive currency for banks and other businesses. So, throwing this to you, Federico, uh, you know, can you share examples of synergies between the banks? vault of data and the evolving tech products to, to to better commercialize this data sure um I, i'm not entirely sure actually uh robert whether um data is the is the, is the right or the, the main concern for banks um, a main concern yeah, yeah it, it's it's definitely a concern indeed and, and in my conversations with banks it, it comes back quite often um but if we look at the customer data um at a bank Think about a regulation like PSD2, right? Um, a lot of the bank data there is related to payments, and that's already being um, accessed these days and, and reorganized by by all of fintechs. And so, from the user interface or the end user's perspective, they don't really care in a way whether 
it's a bank doing their forex or which bank's better right is doing their forex or or which bank is doing their payments and i think the risk there for the bank um is becoming you know pretty much just the, the potential some part of the rails right for um applications like say transferwise or even like my own company novicap that are building on top of the bank's um infrastructure and so from the bank's perspective you don't want to become a back end on which fintechs um, user interfa interfaces are built. So then related to payments, um, I, I, I think from, from, again, from the data perspective, I think that is being opened up a lot. So from that perspective, I think it's something that banks, yes, they do care about because they can apply AI, they can apply machine learning to, to data and find novel ways to underwrite, for instance, customers, which indeed is, is very valuable. Um, however, what I think what really matters um, for the, the C-suite, so to speak, or the executive uh, team is, uh, is a customer relationship. Um, because if you think about what the bank's advantage is, is and what's their competitive moat is the amount of customers they have today. Um, so yes, their systems are legacy. Um, yes, they're slow to innovate. And there are you know, these big, massive oil tankers which change course very um in, in a very difficult way. Um, ho however, they, they do have the, the customers and I think that's where they can build relevant services upon. And so when I meet with, with, um, with CEOs or, or C-level people at banks, that is something that, that is a recurrent topic for them. How can we maintain a client relationship and build and cross sell um, uh, services on, on top of that? And so the, the best banks I see in, in, in the retail space, they are starting to provide that 360 degree a personal finance application. And then more on the business banking side, the the, the, the SMB or the, the corporate side, that's also where you see a lot of banks starting to integrate um, services which allow them to remain relevant. Think about accounting, think about um, treasury systems, trying to really, again, provide those 360 degree um, needs for the organization. And so eventually the point is, and this is what I'm, what I'm hearing at, the, at the, the bank's board level, is if they don't do it, if they don't start to aggregate the services, someone else like maybe an accounting system will surpass them. And so that's why I think um, the client relationship remains top, top of mind um, for, for the banks. Yeah, so I, I've got a different view on top of mind. Top of mind, there are five or six key issues. Uh, but, and I've got a different view on data. I, I think it's more holistic. Uh, and, and the uses of data can be commercialized to drive the, 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 the enterprise. But I want to throw it over our, 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 our two colleagues to have them respond on the data question. Uh, and, and if I don't like what they say, I may respond. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, on, on the data, also um, uh, PSD2, and then you have the, the open banking, and the open banking is uh, going slow, even though uh, regulation uh, here in the Europe uh, is uh, <laughs> punching it through and uh, say that uh, this uh, this has to be be open. The banks are still dragging uh, their feet. Uh, in Opay, they have a monitoring of the open banking uh, uh, in in the world, and uh, those who are up in the uh, the, the master in openness is uh, DBS, uh, Deutsche Bank, uh, Bank City, uh, and even a Chinese uh, bank, uh, DNB from uh, Norway. Uh, and, and then uh, BBVA that we were talking about, and I thought that they were higher up, that they have uh, gone down to leaders in experience. So, so they have slowed down some of the stuff that they uh, usually were very good at. But what we see here that uh, first you need the infrastructure <laughs> for, for the open banking. And then you can start uh, integrating and then you can start uh, utilizing the data. There's a ton of data there. Uh, and, and hopefully this is uh, the new gold mine uh, for, uh, for banks or neobanks or, or the fintechs uh, in this area. But the margins are so uh, thin uh, when it comes to, to the payment side because it's uh, uh, been innovated and uh, opened up uh, completely. So, so the data is uh, hopefully the area that uh, the banks are uh, and the fintechs is uh, going to earn their money, whether uh, they are competing, banks and the uh, fintechs, or if they're collaborating. And I think the latter is uh, usually the, the thing, like the example uh, that uh, was uh, uh, explained early on uh, to it. But they haven't found the, the products yet because you need to have the rails and the infrastructure uh, open uh, for it before you can start uh, gathering the data from uh, your competitors and so forth, and offer something new to your retail customers or to your corporate customers and even uh, SMB side. So it's in the early, early days uh, to take out uh, the big chunk of uh, 
or commercializing and, and monetizing the data side. Uh, that's the way I see it at the moment. Great. Siddharth, so, would you like to comment on that or move on? I think we'd move on. Okay. <laughs> um, so let me move to a, 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 another top of mind C-suite. Every, every bank that I talk to uh, and those that I don't are, are focused on cost reduction. Let's call it efficiency. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, with interest rates so low, with other challenges, even though they're having a good, you know, first six months of this year post-COVID, they're all trying to cut costs. They're all looking, how do I drive efficiency over my um, enterprise, you know, over the next five to 10 years? I want to get it today and I want it to, to continue. Um, so, Siddharth, do you have any examples of, of banks teaming with fintech to bend the, the cost curve? Um, bend the cost curve? Um, not, not so sure about specific examples to that, but, but what we've seen and we have been seeing here for a while is, you know, in, it's more in line, it's more in line with, for, with what Federico was saying that you'll be seeing a number of banks that are looking to or, you know, offer this, um, this full suite of solutions and in Singapore, we're seeing a lot of it in the SME space. Um, as with most other economies, you know, we we are often uh, Singapore is often seen to be this hub for multinationals, etc., which it is. But but the SMEs are still a very 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 critical component of the economy and are underserved. Uh, so uh, one bank in particular comes to mind. You know, so say for example, UOB Bank, they've taken several several initiatives, which is you know tying up with with fintechs or you could say you know hr tech or basically tech firms of different kinds to provide services so it's once hr easily or you know uh, in in for uob it's within their uh, smart biz uh, suite of solutions ranging all the way from payroll to hr to uh, even restaurant deliveries as you know integrating of orders uh, a lot of it picked up during the pandemic you know given the lockdowns and so i'm so there are examples of that i'm not i'm not so sure it's from uh, from a cost perspective but rather it's about meeting meeting uh, a need that has arisen and similarly you know we're seeing dbs while with all the innovation in house that also partnering with with companies uh, with fintechs one area we're seeing a lot of it in fact i think in asia is this whole spectrum of of wealth management services, you know, whether it's robo advisory or, uh, you know, but across different asset classes, several of them have been, again, not so much post COVID, but have already been integrated to the you know, where you just log into your internet banking, and just as you browse your account and you know check your balances, you also have the ability to to invest in in funds, equity funds, or other kinds of funds. Um, so we're seeing a lot of that, and I think that's going to continue. There are several examples of it in Singapore and across, you know, even other re- other economies in the region. Great. Um, Suzanne or Federico, do you want to give any examples that you may have seen? Uh, if not, I can certainly give one. Please go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, so, so I mean, so I, I don't want to make this commercial for our company, but... Um, <laughs> And this is public knowledge, so I can even say the name of the bank. Um, and this is just one example of many. Truist Bank, uh, which was about a $250 billion bank and has recently been able to acquire SunTrust, and now they're a $500 billion bank in the U.S. and you know significantly profitable. Um, they partnered with us to transform their uh, lending uh, activities uh, from the smallest SME to the largest uh, structured uh, transactions, so not consumer, but everything north of consumer, um, and, and they had multiple platforms, multiple processing centers, disjointed businesses, and through uh, the AFS Vision platform, uh, they were able to put everything in one center on one platform, uh, and they drove thirty uh, percent of their costs out of their business. Uh, they were uh, net positive from a, a, an earnings point of view, return point of view uh, in the first 12 months. Uh, and they are getting, uh, continuing to make better efficiency gains uh, year after year after year. 
Um, and it's just one example of how technology can drive down expense when uh, used intelligently by a financial institution or a bank. Um, and you know, I could go on and on. There are many more value propositions from uh, my company or from others. Um, and, and I think the what the banks need to do when they look at strategic transformation in their roadmaps are to prior, prioritize where they're going to get the most competitive uh, return for for their investment. Now, I realize that they have to make choices and, and a regulatory and compliance issues because they are regulated industry are usually going to trump all the other business aspects. But you can get you can partner with technology firms to address the regulatory compliance issues, but also gain a competitive advantage in the market. And that's kind of the sweet spot. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of the intelligent partnership of, of technology, of fintech companies with their innovative approach and their efficiency gains uh, with that of traditional financial institution. And, and how they partner is just so, so critical. How they compete is also critical. Uh, um, well, I, I'm, I, I need to get back to another question. Um, so, so let, let's... Um, that's going to be for Molly. I may throw that out. Um, well, let, let, let's do this one. I, I like this one. What are the top three qualities a bank should consider when vet, vetting a potential fintech partner? Uh, and uh, I will just throw that out to whoever wants to respond. We see a lot of partnerships uh, between uh, fintechs and and, uh, and banks, and uh, it's usually the, the same thing as you do you do with every partnership that uh, you have to fit. It has to fit uh, the banks, uh, who's usually the buyer uh, of uh, whatever uh, that uh, it fits their strategy, what they're doing, cost reduction, expanding market uh, closer to customer uh, service or uh, customer um, handling altogether. Uh, so uh, it, it's achieving the, the corporate goals uh, faster and uh, the more uh, cost uh, effectiveness. I think that's uh, usually the, uh, the most popular part uh, for the banks. And another thing we, we see is that uh, buy, banks are, are ba uh, buying uh, or fintechs are selling a uh, white label. Uh, thing. So, so then the banks uh, with their strong brand, with their customers, the money and everything, they can uh, utilize uh, uh, thing that's so, so the bank keep... Uh, being uh, in, in front line with the banks because something that banks is of course uh, very afraid of is to me, uh, you, uh, lose the, the customer interaction and if they lose that then uh, then uh, <laughs> everything is up to, for them even though they're, they're a strong band. So that's that's a key thing. So uh, and then for the fintech they need to level up uh, with the, the banks because banks they are big, they sit on the money, they, uh, they have the, the customer trust and, and so forth uh, to it. So it, it's a balanced uh, partnership. Uh, so I would say uh, one thing is from the bank side, but uh, also from the fintech side that uh, it, it's, it has to go hand in hand, not a uh, um, customer vendor uh, part, but a, a truly a partnership. Yeah, and I, th I think when you look at it from the fintech side, um, you know, there are areas where they want to compete on their own, but there are many areas where they want to cooperate. Um, so I, I throw that out to Asnar uh, and Federico. Uh, what about from the um, perspective of the, the fintech uh, company? How do they see the banks and the relationship? Okay, I'll go. so I think I think uh, the first thing is clearly in terms of I, I would say it's in terms of two things, right? One purely from a fintech standpoint is in terms of, of the trust that traditional banks have built in people over the years and their immediate reach. So for a fintech that is, you know, may have a great product or service um, in terms of immediate reach, perhaps very few things, uh, very few ways to, to get immediate reach as compared to say partnering with a bank and, you know, hence getting access to a customer base. Um, another aspect, I think, but then I, I would say this this is 
equally important, as Susan was saying, for both uh, banks and fintechs is you know, what what we can, how do we put it, the centricity of the customer in terms of in in terms of you know customer experience, customer convenience. Uh, I think that uh, incorporates a lot of things. Basically, building sort of like a jigsaw, you know, trying to find the right fit so that a customer has whether a corporate or a retail customer has access to as many solutions as possible on you know on one app or under one roof so to speak i think i think those would be the the two most important aspects in my view thank you federico uh, i'll answer the question a little bit more from um, the fintech entrepreneur perspective right which is eventually where, where i come from the, the first piece of advice I, I would give both to the bank, but also to the entrepreneur, while um, it's very exciting from the PR perspective, from the marketing perspective, to put in the press, we're partnering with GP Morgan, don't white label your IP. I think either you run a company like Robert does, which is in the business of having a lot of banking customers, and they don't run a proprietary lending business, if we're talking specifically about lending, for instance. If, if that is your business, great. You need to have as many bank customers as possible. And you go to all the big banks and you go to the, to, 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 to the, you know, the whole spectrum of addressable market of banks. However, if you're a fintech and you're operating on, on a standalone basis, uh, for instance, a Novicap, a, uh, a funding circle, um, but also a Cabbage, um, a Omdeck, um, which all you know are firms that have tried banking partnerships. I would say don't white label your, your IP. If that's really core for your business, keep it keep it proprietary. Um, and so from um, from from the bank's perspective, that so so that's that's both for, for banks and, and fintechs. But I think another reason for banks is that a lot of these partnerships fail. And so from that perspective, I think it's much better as a bank if the if the technology is that um, cutting edge, so to speak, you have to acquire it and acquire it before another bank does. And I think that's where we see some banks like, say, JP Morgan, right, Jamie Lyman, that has really bold on acquisitions. They're going to spend, spend big time in the coming years to acquire whatever they need. And some European peers where I, 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 uh, I speak with quite often, they're not moving fast enough. And so again, this is about technology. So you have to incorporate it into the bank quickly if you want to be around for the next 100 years. And so this relationship um, really reminds me of this scene in, in Finding Nemo. If, if you all know the, if you know the movie, there is this scene where Nemo meets vegetarian sharks. And those vegetarian sharks really remind me of banks, right? They, they're meeting and they're chanting, fish are friends, not food. Fish are friends, not food. And so the banks have been indoctrinated by you know, meeting with, with fintechs, by um, running fintech accelerator programs, being guilty myself, having been part of, a, of one of them. Um, and so it's a lot of fun, all of that. And it, you know, it, 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 uh, it, it brings a good vibe for banks. It, it does something about employee retention. But essentially, they're shaking hands while they should be eating the fish. And that will be my, my key message to, to banks. If you're really, if you're hungry for technology, eat. Spend your big fat IT budgets on corporate development, on acquisitions rather than IT. Uh, uh, you know, it's nice to be in the position of Jamie Dimon where he can develop all he wants and buy yes. all he wants because they're so darn profitable. Uh, many of the European banks don't have the same profit margins and they have different choices to make. But your, your points are incredibly well taken. Hey, before I, I, I ask everyone, I, I see that uh, Marianne Morrow is in the uh, in the room and she's got a, a clap hand up. I don't know. Marianne, if you want to ask a question, just grab the mic. And, and if not, we'll just keep going on. Uh, but I thought I'd, I, I'd ask because I'm not sure what that little hand means. Uh, maybe you like what, what uh, we're all saying or maybe you want to ask a question. Um, okay. Uh, just j just just checking. Um, <clears throat> no, she, I mean, she actually left a comment that she's trying to grab the microphone. Oh, she did. Okay. Uh, there, there is a um, a microphone exactly, and I think now you have. She, to, she wants. Oh, maybe she wants I have the letter. Okay, uh, I just gave you the microphone. Okay, uh, somebody checked on her. 
Uh, yeah, I so, there she is. Hi guys, how are you? Welcome. Um, hi from Silicon Valley. I'm wanting to know what trends you think are we should follow in the next couple of years as we move into this digitization. That's a big question. <laughs> That's a very big question. Okay, well, uh, who wants to go first? Uh, I'll go. No, I'll go last. <laughs> okay, it, it depends on uh, which uh, part of the ba bank uh, you're in. If it's uh, the retail or the corporate, and and uh, so forth. So, uh, but I think uh, digitalization as the, as the big uh, explanation is is uh, probably the area. Whether you acquire it, like Frederico is uh, saying, uh, by buying uh, the stuff, or you build it in house, or uh, you merge with another bank or, or, or do something. But digitalization is a, is absolutely. And then you need to run the process uh, properly. Uh, some think that uh, the IT department is the one that uh, is going to do the changes and run uh, everything. It has to be driven by the uh, from the business side and top level. So um, you see more and more of the boards uh, in the banks, they, they realize uh, that they, they need to understand digitalization. They need to understand what needs to be done, uh, the process and, and so forth. But uh, again, uh, I believe the digitalization will um, will uh, be the, the main main uh, topic uh, and trend going forward. If someone wants to follow, add to that. I'm I'm happy to chip in. I think one 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 area which I find um, particularly exciting is the the core banking mm -hmm. system, which um, is one of the most outdated parts of a bank. <laughs> Um, I've encountered that uh, throughout my relatively uh, short period in, in financial services slash fintech myself. Um, to give you an example, um, recently I met with um, it's a top 10 European bank, which every one of us will recognize. Um, they are almost weekly probably in the news for fintech and, and uh, the highly innovative nature of their bank. And... Um, we're very much looking at a partnership with them um, for a specific part uh, of their business, not going into too much detail. And um, so w one of the areas which, which came, came back was indeed the core banking system. And um, when we started to inquire, it went to, to APIs. It, it was about you know, integrations with, with the, the core banking system. We realized that the bank's uh, core banking system is, is coded in MAGIC which is very much an obsolete programming language of the 90s. Uh, so it is relatively uh, dated, I would say. And so when we start to inquire more, nobody really could provide us with the answer, right? How to integrate, how certain parts of the core banking system would, would move around and, and behave if we were to make an integration. And uh, then someone said like, hey, but we can, we, can, we can call up the senior architect. And then we asked, okay, who is the senior architect? And, and so, in, in this case, um, he was really senior because of his age. In fact, he's retired. And he's the only person in the entire bank, which is thousands of people, who can pinpoint or help if there is an outdown with a certain part of the core banking system because he's the one who designed um, you know, 20, 30 years ago. He's the architect. And so this bank has had several breakdowns at you know, ATMs not functioning. Um, wires being made to wrong the wrong uh, PE, um, disbursements of loans going to, to the wrong uh, the, the wrong uh, entities. And uh, so this is really reflective of, of, of the state of the core banking system. I think it's very exciting to see uh, people innovating around that because it's really what runs a bank. And so there's systems like uh, Top Machine and others um, which are building it from, from, from the ground up with FinTech in, in mind and also all the API connections out of the box. So I think that's that's a very inter interesting trend. And so I will be monitoring how many banks are moving their core banking system around because then also other adjacent services built on top of that new core banking system will be gaining speed because they're easier to integrate, including FinTech. Um, we, we've, we've got one minute left. I'll, I'll just say five seconds yeah. on core banking systems. I have real problems with them. Uh, it's, it's not a concept that makes sense to me. You, you can't have one size fit all for everything you do. And unless you use it as a spinal cord and have very good APIs and web services to bring other best in breed technology in and integrate that, which is a challenge. I, I don't know why. In the U.S., um, more and more they've gotten away from core banking systems. Uh, and, and in Europe, it's still uh, the flavor of the generation. Uh, but this has been a uh, very uh, good panel. I thank each of you. 
And I would like, uh, you know, any final thoughts first from uh, Suzanne. Um, just wanted to touch about uh, ESG and impact. Uh, Thank you. So there's a lot uh, out there and uh, you see it in investors and so forth. Those who are pure, pure uh, bottom line profit uh, thing, they understand that impact is uh, needed. I just wanted to pinpoint to two, three companies uh, that I'm aware of. Normative, uh, they are helping out the corporations such all over the world, even banks, uh, to, to help them with the ESG uh, reporting. And they say that uh, ESG reporting is uh, takes uh, 70% and then financial reporting is uh, is uh, 30%. So that gives them, uh, there, there's a lot of opportunities out there and the world needs uh, to uh, see more of the ESG. Great, uh, um, I think I think when you know uh, all all of you have spoken as participants in the fintech and banking industry, I, I come from the perspective of a watcher, you know, in terms of what trends we see and and uh, I think one of one of the things that um, is very hard to address is whenever we 